think we are, I have on my timepiece here, 956. Um, Stephanie, what do you think if we started with introductions? I think that's a great idea. Let's start. Okay. And just a reminder um, for those on, on the Zoom call, it's helpful if you mute yourself and that way, unless you're speaking, that way we can better hear the speaker and we, we don't hear as many of the background sounds um, coming from, from your space. And uh, we're so grateful that all of you are on the call this morning, joining our adult education class at Potomac Presbyterian Church. And we always begin our classes giving this time to God in prayer. So let's begin with prayer. Good and gracious God on this glorious new day, we invite you into this time and space as we learn, as we study, as we grow in awareness of our world and in knowledge of you. I pray, Lord, that you will anoint Zavin with your Holy Spirit as he leads and teaches and guides us through this situation that our brothers and sisters in Armenia are facing today. And we pray, Lord, and lift up to you this country of Armenia and the people that are facing persecution and those who need to know your presence with them now. I pray, Lord, that as we learn and discuss, as we listen and uh, are aware of your teaching, that you would use us in ways that we can be faithful to build up your body on earth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to turn our time over now to Sonia, who's going to introduce our speaker, and we'll move forward with that. Good morning. I'm Sonia Adruni Russo. I'm honored to introduce to you today Mr. Zavin Khanjian, the Executive Director, CEO of the Armenian Missionary Association of America, the AMAA. The AMAA was founded in 1918. It is a nonprofit charitable organization serving as the missionary arm of the Armenian Evangelical Protestant church worldwide. It is one of the most vital and trusted spiritual and humanitarian associations for Armenians everywhere, providing a range of educational, evangelistic, relief, social services, church, and child care ministries in 24 countries. These days, Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh are topmost in their concerns, and that is why Mr. Khanjian is with us. Nagorno-Karabakh, I should note, is known as Artsakh by Armenians, and that is how we will be referring to that region this morning. Thank you, Zaven, for coming, and thank you, Pastor Emily, Chris McAuliffe, the Christian Education Committee, the Mission Committee, and all of you in this class right now for taking to heart the sufferings of Armenians in Artsakh and Armenia. Like me, Zaven was born and raised in Aleppo, Syria. We have in common our early nurturing in the Armenian Evangelical Church of Aleppo and our schooling at the associated elementary school there. In fact, Zaven and my sister Salpi Adruni of Atlanta, Georgia, were kindergarten classmates. This photo, which you will see in a minute. Um, uh, I, Zav uh, can, can you see the picture? No. Oh, okay. Well, um, we'll 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 get to it when when Chris can put it up. But it shows Zavin and uh, and I think it might be the picture you were referring to, Zavin. Um, um, I'll move on. After his early years in Aleppo, Zavin left for Lebanon, 
where he completed a degree in business administration at the American University of Beirut. For 13 years, he worked in the Persian Gulf area, assuming top positions in various prestigious companies. Please. By 1979, he and his family were living in California, and by 1987, Zaven was the founder of Kanjian Realty, a successful company in Glendale. So what do you know? Just another successful immigrant story, right? But let me tell you what really matters about Zaven to us Armenians. It is his devotion and tireless efforts over the years to enhance the well-being of our people wherever in the world they might be. The list is long. All the Armenian spiritual, business, and humanitarian organizations in which Zaven has had leadership roles in the Los Angeles area and beyond. They include the Armenia Fund, the Armenian Evangelical Union of North America, the Merdinian Armenian Evangelical School, the Haigazian University of Beirut, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, the Syrian Armenian Relief Fund, and more. In September 2019, Zaven was awarded honorary membership in the Writers' Union of Armenia. He has contributed volumes of bilingual articles to American Armenian media and is the author of three Armenian books. When in 2014, the board of directors of the Armenian Missionary Association of America appointed Zaven to be the executive director, director and CEO, they had in mind his passion for his people and his extensive management experience, which would help him advance the work of the AMAA. So it is with extreme humility, gratitude and pride that I introduce to you Mr. Zaven Kanjian, father, grandfather, author, businessman, humanitarian leader, executive director, CEO, and fellow Christian. Thank you, Zaven, for agreeing to join us today and for giving us insight into the situation in Armenia and Artsakh. <clears throat> Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I have a special gratitude to the Potomac Presbyterian Church, Pastor Emily, and, and all the officers there, and all those in charge and responsible for this initiative. Uh, I certainly have a special uh, place in my heart for the Adrunis and the Karamanugians, uh, who take me to my childhood, my sweet childhood in, in Aleppo, Syria which uh, the story, the childhood, I memorialized in another book uh, called Aleppo, the first station. It's in Armenian, unfortunately, for some, uh, which uh, mm, certainly brings up uh, the beautiful, uh, that beautiful place that uh, our fathers, the survivors of the genocide, took refuge uh, after the 1915 uh, so it's again, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I think the subject of the time is, of course, Artsakh uh, and, and, and the world that we uh, experienced. Uh, and I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with a reading from the scripture, which describes uh, how we feel today. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. You know, for 44 days, starting with September, on September 27, uh, we passed through uh, a daily nightmare. And when I say daily, uh, um, especially being on, uh, on, on this side of the world. It was day and night. Uh, we were mostly uh, alert, awake, following up the war. A war uh, which uh, started uh, uh, by Azerbaijan, uh, planned and initiated, uh, led by Turkey, I would say, and supported by mercenaries that were brought from Syria. 
and a salt that came from two countries who had a population of 80 million dollars, 80 million people, and and the country that is a NATO member, and uh, that says in, in itself says a lot. Uh, it was a fierce attack uh, with different um, uh, technology being utilized in the war compared to the one that was fought in the 19, early 1990s. Uh, <clears throat> it, it was a terrible experience. And, and what I read is totally true. Uh, it was a calamity that no one can disparage and a pain that no one can minimize. Uh, but we marched in the Valley of the uh, Dead before, and uh, we have uh, been in this area. This is a moment in history, and it's a phase in a, in a long-term um, boundaries of uh, history of our martyred nation. Uh, we certainly will not be crushed. We refuse to be crushed perplexed or entangled and have no time to lose. We'll talk about a little later as to what we've done, but my motto has been that uh, after this, it, it is a defeat and no one can deny that it was a defeat on the battlefront, uh, that we are standing up uh, without losing any time uh, as uh, I initiated on November 10th, which was the day after that that uh, painful agreement was signed in starting our operations back, opening our office uh, and um, initiating steps to, to start us to restart, uh, embark on our services and uh, programs in Artsakh. Uh, <clears throat> what I like to do is uh, cover a few facts about Artsakh. Uh, and, and as I cover those facts, I, I certainly will uh, expand a little bit of, uh, on them. You know, Artsakh has always been predominantly occupied by Armenians. Our history goes back there centuries, many, many centuries. As a matter of fact, if we take uh, the, the last phase uh, prior to the independent, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union and in the independence of, of the um, countries that made up the Soviet Union, we will see that uh, the, the Bolsheviks in 1921 gave a special status to nagorno karabakh as it was called at the time, Arsa, as we call it, because it was Armenian populated, predominantly Armenian populated. And even within the Soviet, within Soviet Azerbaijan, uh, Artsakh was an, uh, um, uh, an autonomous uh, oblast, a region, an autonomous region within the boundaries of Soviet Azerbaijan, but it was an autonomous region. Why? Because it was predominantly Armenian populated. The history of this Armenian populated um, uh, region goes back, as I said, to centuries, and we have a lot of stories from the 17th, 18th, 19th century where the, the, the people of, of nagorno karabakh have always been harassed and, and uh, uh, under the dominance of the Persians, of the Russians, have always pleaded to the Tsar of Russia to, to assist them, to help them in, in various manners. So fact number one is that nobody denies that this area, Ar Artsakh proper, is pre has been predominantly occupied by Armenians all throughout history. The second fact is that the Artsakh landscape is punctuated by a tremendous amount of evidence of Armenian history going back to the fourth, fifth century. Why? Because you find all these churches and monasteries on the land. Some are in ruins and, and some are uh, in, uh, in use today. Some have been um, repaired and renovated, but it is, there, is, there are a lot, I would say dozens and dozens, maybe even in the hundreds overall in the area, but in nagorno karabakh proper, proper uh, th there are many, many 
it going back it goes back to the fourth century uh, uh, the the monastery of Amaras going to the sixth and fifth centuries uh, Cizerna Bank uh, and and many others from Gaditsa Bank from the 13th century uh, the Kataro Bank 17th century Datia Bank Dativa Banks 13th century uh, and and many many more there is a a big list of it with pictures of this on the internet. I think you can find and see it. So that shows that this country, that this state, that this nation that uh, accepted Christianity, the first nation that accepted Christianity as the state of the religion has all that history on its land. And we're not talking about uh, West, uh, um, East, uh, historic Armenia, Eastern Turkey, Anadolia now, where most of these churches, of, of course, are in ruins now after the genocide. But th this is an area where, uh, where it was populated. We didn't see the genocide then in, in this area. And you will see um, many of those churches on the landscape of both Armenia proper and Artsakh proper. Third, Artsakh has never been part of independent Azerbaijan. In the history of the world, in the history of Azerbaijan, there is no mention of Azerbaijan until 1918. The first time the world heard about, about the name of a state called Azerbaijan, when the Turks in that region declared independence in 1918, uh, after the, the Bolshevik revolution, when the three countries in the Caucasus, in the Southern Caucasus, uh, <clears throat> Georgia, Armenia, and, and Azerbaijan declared independence. That was the first time um, Azerbaijan was heard. And uh, <clears throat> then in two years time, without going into details of the history, in two years time, all these three nations which had declared independence in 1918 became part of the Soviet Union. So the Bolsheviks uh, came down and then they, they uh, extended their, their power and dominance in that region. And so all these three countries became Soviet, Armenia, Soviet, Azerbaijan, and Soviet Georgia. It was at that time when Stalin, who was a, a certainly a junior officer at the time, uh, decided to, uh, to move, you know, the borders of Azerbaijan and leave Artsakh within uh, the borders of Azerbaijan, again, as an autonomous region, not totally part of the landscape of Azerbaijan, but as an autonomous region predominantly uh, occupied by Armenians. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and for the first time, these nations in the modern world, um, um, I'm talking about Armenia in the modern world declared independence uh, and Azerbaijan for the first time. Uh, nagorno karabakh uh, already in 1988 had declared its independence from Soviet Union uh, because of the, as allowed by the constitution of the Soviet Union and again repeated in 1991 um, that they wanted to be part of Armenia uh, and the referendum uh, was um, um, voted upon with um, the majority, absolute majority, uh, first wanting to unite with Armenia and then secondly of declared independence in September 1991. So um, Azerbaijan declared its independence again in, at that time and Artsakh declared its independence in when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991. And so Artsakh was never ever part of independent Azerbaijan. Now that's uh, fact number three. Uh, fact number four is that um, Artsakh uh, exercised, ex the, the people in Artsakh always democratically exercised their rights of self-determination. So that started, as I said, when Gorbachev was in power in the Soviet Union and there were signs of perestroika and, 
and uh, enlightenment a little bit in, in Soviet Union and, and it, in the, the dominance uh, of, of the Stalin era and later eased uh, the uh, um, Artsakhsis, uh, the population of nagorno karabakh moved in 1988 to the streets to declare, to ask for its independence. And so they exercised uh, from that time their right of self-determination within the boundaries of the Soviet Union and within the constitution of the Soviet Union to declare independence. Uh, and, and so they knew how to exercise their own democratic rights. And that went on after the uh, formal independence in 1991 on, on, until uh, September 27, uh, 2020. And uh, the, the country itself, uh, the Republic of Artsakh had, had all the, um, the structure of an independent country, uh, a parliament, uh, uh, their, their ministries, uh, all the institutions that make up an independent country. Uh, then, then finally, it is also a fact that on September 27, 2020, uh, the Turkish Azeri mercenary assault uh, started uh, on Artsakh and lasted, as we said, for 44 days. <clears throat> uh, it's a sad state uh, of uh, status in, in, in Armenia and state of uh, spirit, I would say, uh, of all Armenians uh, all around the world, uh, because uh, the uh, the strike is is hard, uh, it is painful, and it certainly hurts. Uh, the other uh, part which hurts is is that we don't know what the future will bring. Uh, yes, there's a tri-party uh, agreement now signed by Armenia, whereby uh, mm -hmm. All the land, all that the seven regions which were occupied by Armenians in the 19, uh, 19, early 1990 war, which ended in 94, were returned or already uh, dominated by Azerbaijan during the war. Not only that, but also parts of Artsakh proper, and talking about that Soviet uh, uh, oblast, is also now occupied by. Uh, by the Azeris, uh, including the city of uh, Shushi. So it, it really hurts. We don't know what will happen. This agreement is for five years, as probably uh, you've read, uh, to be renewed um, if, one of, if none of the parties, of the three parties, cancels it six months before the five years end. So what will happen in uh, Armenia? What will bring uh, us the future? We don't know, uh, but, but here our task overall is within these five years, of course, is to uh, certainly regroup, uh, stand up. Uh, our history is one of resilience, steadfastness, self-confidence and courage. And I'm sure that we will be able to stand up and utilize these five years uh, in, um, um, in, in leading, uh, hopefully, uh, being a strong country, uh, leading diplomatic uh, negotiations, whereby the world recognizes the right of self-determination of Artsakh. You know, the world, the recent world, the, 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 um, the world that we uh, are living in right now in the recent history shows many examples of that. Uh, and uh, you, you've heard all those names. Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Ossetia. Now, these are, let's say, uh, still in the Soviet uh, Union and uh, debatable. But take Kosovo, which the West uh, partitioned from, from um, in, in Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia was, was partitioned and, and cut it up from Serbia uh, again in the late 1990s, and it, it, it is an independent country now. Uh, I want to remind you of e Ethiopia, uh, of Eritrea, which was cut out of Ethiopia. I want to remind you of South Sudan. Uh, and let's not forget Cyprus, uh, which is uh, ridiculously uh, the, the double standard of, of Turkey, uh, that they remain 
uh, occupying Cyprus uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and uh, they certainly aspire for a free and independent northern Cyprus in there where the, the Turks and the Turks that Im they imported from, from Turkey live in. So there are so many examples that, that the modern world and, uh, has, uh, has um, realized as, um, and made them come true. Uh, and that, of course, can be uh, a good example of, of what um, we like to see in Artsakh as well in the coming five years, uh, which will certainly, hopefully, resolve uh, our aspiration and the aspiration of its people. Uh, we started seeing that uh, in France, the, the, the French Senate uh, voted for uh, and acknowledged the independence of Artsakh a few days ago. Uh, I think there are uh, resolutions uh, in, in, in the House of Representatives, in Congress, uh, we certainly like to see that come through as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, the rest of it is a matter of will, determination, and of course, certainly a lot of it takes uh, abilities of the, of the Armenian sovereign state and its leadership and its uh, diplomacy. Um, before we go into uh, the presentation of uh, the uh, AMAA and what the AMAA does and has done and who is it. Uh, we will move quickly. Uh, we have a, a good size of PowerPoint presentation, but uh, I'm very thankful uh, that uh, uh, Sonia already uh, made an introduction uh, of uh, the AMAA and we know a little bit about it. Uh, <clears throat> I'll come to what we expect from our Christian friends and churches then later after that presentation. So uh, I think it is time that uh, we now go. Uh, Christine, if you help me, we'll start with the presentation. And while you set the uh, presentation on the screen, uh, as Sonia said, uh, the AMAA is the, uh, is the missionary arm of the Armenian Evangelical uh, Church. The Armenian Evangelical Church will celebrate its 175th anniversary next year. And we have a lot of big plans of celebrating that uh, in Armenia on July 1st, uh, 2021. Uh, it was, the Armenian Evangelical Church was established in Constantinople in 1846 on July 1st, and currently has uh, five unions spread all over the world. And so, the AMAA is a partner with all the Armenian Evangelical unions and churches around the world. Uh, it was founded in 1918, as, uh, we, uh, as Sonia uh, introduced, uh, and, and it's dedicated to the cultivation, religious cultivation, spiritual growth, and development of the Armenian people. And it's built on four pillars, evangelism, education, youth programs, and humanitarian and, and relief. Yeah. Next. Uh, we, we start, uh, oh, yeah, this is, I would say, uh, our motto, our guiding light, uh, AMAs. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever action service program we are in, this is what guides us. And this is the light of Jesus Christ is what we bring to, to the world and to those we serve. Next. Uh, this is a picture of the 24 countries uh, that uh, we serve in, uh, from Australia to, uh, to the West, the, the Americas, North and South, and especially a lot of countries in the Near East and, and Europe. Uh, and of course, uh, since 1988, uh, in Armenia and Artsakh, excuse me. Yeah, 1988, that's when we started. Next. Uh, evangelism is the support that we give to the five unions that I mentioned. And we, he, these are the five unions. In the Americas, we have the Armenian uh, uh, Evangelical Union of Ameri North America, but the South America has, is part of it. We have a union in Eurasia, 
the nearest is the oldest uh, in Europe and Armenia and Artsakh, five unions. Uh, so we support all the churches in these unions and, and the number is, is huge. Uh, and it's somewhere in b- between 120, 140, um, uh, depending on when uh, that um, count was made. Uh, here are some of the churches that uh, we have. Uh, you see the Gumri uh, Church and Community Center was uh, dedicated last year uh, in 2018, 2019. Uh, <clears throat> and the other churches are also, the one in the right is in Brussels uh, and the one on the left is in um, Banats or in Armenia. Next. Uh, There are more churches, of course, uh, all over the world, as I said, Syria, uh, Sochi. The one at the bottom on the left is the Armenian uh, Evangelical Church, Congregation Church uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, where where on June 8, 1918, the AMAA was founded. Next. Uh, The the other uh, pillar, that we stand on is education. And I would say that Armenian evangelicals have been pioneers in education. They've introduced uh, education in in the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, opened hundreds of schools, seminaries. The first all girls school was established by the Armenian evangelical church. uh, And uh, a lot more of uh, dynamism is brought into education. So after the genocide, when uh, when the survivors of the genocide uh, ended up uh, in um, settling in, in the Near East, uh, the first schools uh, were opened there, but then expanded. We have now schools in Armenia, in Lebanon, in Artsakh, the U.S., and and in Syria. We'll see a few next. We'll see a few pictures of uh, those schools. This is the latest school, state of the art school the Khoren and Shushani Gavetsian School in Armenia. It was intentionally established in the most impoverished neighborhood in Yerevan. It's a school that collects no tuition. It's a free education school, uh, and it educates the children of the Malatya Sepastia region in in, uh, Yerevan. Uh, The benefactors, uh, and by the way, the the, um, auditorium of this uh, uh, of this school, uh, wa- the benefactor of the auditorium of this school are the Karians uh, from Boston. Um, and um, the Mr. Avedisian of Boston, who's a, a personal friend of the Karians there, uh, is the um, benefactor. Next, <clears throat> we'll see more schools. Uh, uh, it um, was awarded the silver. Um, Award of LEAD, which is leadership uh, uh, in energy. Uh, um, and uh, it's, it, it's a modern school that, that uses all technology. What you see in the pictures are the roof, the green roofs of the school where children learn, where children uh, plant and sow and learn. And as you also see the panels that uh, uh, generate electricity there. It's a state-of-the-art school. And the gentleman on the right uh, is Mr. Ed Avedisian, the benefactor of the school. Next. Uh, this is the school in uh, Sherman Oaks, California. Uh, next, we'll see other schools in the picture. This is Haigazian University. The only Armenian university in the diaspora is the Haigazian University, which was founded in 1955 jointly by the Union of the Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East and the Armenian Missionary Association of America, AMA. AMA, uh, excuse me, Haigazian University is celebrating its 65th anniversary this year. And because of the pandemic, many of their plans, of course, uh, were canceled. But we dedicated the AMA news, the issue that uh, is uh, now on print and we'll hit you mailboxes of all those um, who are (coughs) members of the AMAA very soon is dedicated to Haigazian University. Next. Uh, there, there are other schools in Kesab, Syria, uh, the uh, Army Evangelical Emmanuel School in Aleppo, 
uh, unfortunately, um, the girls' high school and the Emmanuel Boys' School are currently uh, enrolled by Arab students, but we have the Bethel School uh, in, uh, enrolled by Armenians in, in Aleppo, Syria. Education continues on all levels all around the world. Next. <clears throat> Uh, more in Lebanon, uh, we have four schools in Lebanon, uh, Central High School, uh, the Anjar School, uh, one in Burj Hamoud, and one next to High Gazian University. All these are high schools, uh, and we have approximately a thousand students enrolled in these schools. Because of the war in Lebanon, next, uh, because of the war in Lebanon, uh, and because of the socioeconomic uh, condition uh, in in uh, Lebanon. It was decided that uh, uh, tuition will be limited to $100 all this year uh, in these schools. So the AMA, of course, uh, is funding much of the balance. Next, uh, uh, one of the <clears throat> casualties of the of the war are our kindergartens uh, in Artsakh. Uh, the city of uh, Shushi was occupied by the Azeris, and we lost uh, three essential ministries there. One is a kindergarten, one is a shogh center. The shogh centers are educational centers, schools uh, after school, after public schools. These children come to our shogh schools and learn a lot. And then we have the camp, the Bedrosian camp. Next, uh, Christine. Uh, the, the only camp in, uh, in uh, Shushi, excuse me, in Artsakh was the Bedrosian camp um, funded uh, and the benefactors are the Bedrosian family from Fresno. Uh, unfortunately, this beautiful camp is now on, in Azeri hands. Uh, here are exam <coughs> examples of uh, uh, pictures of the shock centers in, <coughs> this is the one in Yerevan and there are six uh, uh, or seven shock centers now uh, in Armenia and Artsakh, and we're expanding the, this after school educational centers for the children of Armenia and Artsakh. Next. <clears throat> um, the, the, this, there are buildings, community centers, I would say. Um, many of them uh, are uh, new or renovated. This is the one in Stepanavan being rebuilt and the church also being renovated there. Next. <clears throat> Another shock center in Vanazor. Again, this is a new premises that we acquired. And uh, uh, next, Christine. Uh, another casualty, as I said, is the shock center in, in Shushi. See this, the, the faces of these children. What will happen to these children in Shushi? We don't know where will they go. We don't know, but we're ready to help them and assist them settle in in Artsakh proper. That is, with in Armenian hands, uh, and at the, for the time being, of course, where the Russian peacekeepers are. <clears throat> Next, and moving to youth uh, programs, of course, as a church, you know all the uh, services uh, that are offered in the church. And, and so we have uh, Christian endeavor groups, camps, daily vacation Bible schools, internship programs, a lot more. So in these five unions, um, we have camps and we'll see some of the pictures uh, of the camps uh, in the unions. Next. Uh, we have the annual summer internship, which takes youth uh, from uh, the West, from West Europe and the Americas to Armenia. Uh, to introduce, uh, I, I always say, Armenia 101 and AMA 101. Uh, your youth, any one of them, you know, in your families who uh, is at the age of high school graduate or first year college, this is very good for them. They, they can participate and uh, uh, learn and be introduced to the homeland. Next. Uh, this is the largest camp in Armenia, is the Hankavan camp. <clears throat> There's a, a lot of pictures. There are 5,000 uh, young people go through that every summer. It's a long summer. Various groups from um, both Armenia, uh, um, our churches, and 
uh, other uh, youth uh, go through this camp. Uh, one of the programs that the uh, signature programs that the AMA has, which started in 1988 when Armenia, when AMA uh, entered Armenia was right after the earthquake of 1988, uh, is the sponsorship of the children's orphan and child care sponsorship program. And so all participants, which are around 1,600 uh, now <clears throat> in Armenia and Artsakh, uh, all these children are invited to go to camp in summer. Next. Uh, the Bedrosian camp that I spoke about, of course, in Shushi is a beautiful camp and we've lost it now under Azeri rule. We don't know what will happen to it. I, I, I don't lose hope, uh, but, but uh, let's say right now, uh, we will not be able to use it at least this year. Next. <clears throat> More camps in France. There are two camps in France. There is a camp, a beautiful camp in, in Lebanon uh, called Kachak. Uh, there is a Syria Kachak as well, which is a, a, it, it's the uh, it's in Armenian uh, translates into the youth center, youth camp uh, for children. Uh, the, the word Kachak. <clears throat> so this is the one in Syria, in Kesab, Syria. Next. We have uh, more in the U.S. Uh, camp Arevelk, uh, uh, which uh, is a rented uh, camp in on the East Coast, and Camp Arev in California, which is a beautiful uh, place. Uh, I would say around the year, around the year, and subject to uh, renovations, growth, and additions. <clears throat> Next. Uh, Humanitarian programs is the fourth leg that uh, the AMA stands on. And uh, although we might not have pictures here, but I would like to say that uh, the AMA not only assists uh, uh, Armenia and Armenians, that's its main task and field, uh, but also um, calamities uh, all around the world, uh, the AMA assist, uh, assistance has been um, extended to Haiti, to um, um, Burma, to uh, of course, uh, to all the the, the subjects of uh, uh, hurricanes uh, in the south, in, in many of the south areas, the AMA also extends its uh, assistance uh, through uh, the Red Cross or through other churches. Uh, naturally, uh, all these areas that you see in Armenia, Artsakh, Lebanon, Canada, Syria and Iraq, especially next, uh, Christine, especially during the Syria war, <clears throat> for the 10 years uh, starting from 2011, uh, our brothers and sisters in, in Syria, of course, suffered a lot during the civil war in Syria. Uh, our community uh, in Aleppo or in Syria dwindled from 70,000 to around 10,000 now, uh, but, uh, but the AMA continued on supporting and sustaining all those who stayed there and all those who moved to Lebanon, to Armenia and to Canada. And it continues on doing so as we speak today. Next. Uh, Christmas Joy programs are programs uh, where we bring around this year 12,000 uh, children in, in Artsakh and, and Armenia together on Christmas, talk to them of course, uh, about the birth of Christ, the, the, the biggest present that mankind has received, and then give them a box of uh, a, a shoe box or a bag of a present, have fun and, and have a great time uh, and uh, have a happy time. Many of them, this will be the box or the bag that they get from the AMA is the only present that they get uh, at Christmas time. <clears throat> Next. Uh, during the, all these years uh, before this last war, there have been skirmishes on the borders, of course, on many, many occasions. Uh, Azerbaijan has uh, <clears throat> attacked uh, at, and at various times, various times and on various locations and various ends of the borders. And, and so we've had martyrs. Uh, the AMA always has jumped uh, if, if those martyrs were married and have children, 
we've jumped to sponsor their children. And if they were, um, of course, um, not married, uh, we've helped their parents uh, and who have lost uh, a son um, and, and assisted in renovating their homes, <clears throat> on a partially taking uh, partially the responsibility of the lost uh, um, manpower of their children. Next. Uh, the Milk Fund is, a, again, one of the oldest programs that we have since 1988, and it uh, provides uh, powder milk to mothers who cannot breastfeed their children. It's a very important uh, program. And now during the war, we have expanded that tremendously, assisting all Artsakh uh, families, uh, in the resettled families in Armenia uh, and wherever they are. Uh, and assisting them with uh, providing them with mm, milk fund. Stitch with Love uh, is a program that one of our supporters started and um, Good Samaritans stitch blankets, hats, and we provide them to these children on an ongoing basis. You see in the pictures, the, the, the infants wearing uh, what has been stitched with love and delivered to them. Next. Uh, same pictures of uh, products, Stitch with Love, next. Uh, the child, I spoke about the child sponsorship program. Uh, these are children who are uh, to be sponsored. They are on AMA's website. Uh, and uh, they, they graduate at the age of 18. I think we changed that to 16, but, but uh, in spe on special, uh, circumstances, we still take the two years as well to, to the age of 18. Next. Uh, we also have a program that sponsors grannies, especially after, again, the Soviet Union collapsed. Many of the seniors in, in Armenia were, um, did not have any social security or, or whatever they had was uh, um, meaningless. So we have started an adapt the granny program and support the grannies, the gradually the number of those is now uh, diminishing. Next. Uh, <clears throat> again, during the Syria war, the AMA realized uh, that the best way that we can sustain, of course, the nation is to assist and help those uh, victims of the Syria war and later on in Lebanon as well in moving them to Armenia rather than let them... Uh, um, and go around uh, the world uh, without ability to uh, decide uh, how and where to settle. So we assist families to move to Armenia and pay all their cost of transportation from their home to the Zvartnots airport in Yerevan. And when they land there, we provide housing or assistance to rent, rent assistance and also try to find them jobs and try to repatriate Armenians from the, the endangered areas of the Near East uh, to Armenia. <clears throat> that is the, the program uh, that we're committed to. And we, we, had, we started it during the Syria war, and now we're continuing with the socioeconomic and other troubles in Lebanon. Next. Uh, okay, let's uh, take, uh, let's watch this. Uh, two clips that will not give us more time. Uh, oh, on, let's, let's only watch this one, uh, Christine, uh, that will give a history and then we'll take uh, questions uh, for the remaining few minutes. Yeah. Artsakh is a small mountainous region in the South Caucasus, and it's beautiful. It all started with Uartu a bazillion years ago. Hello world, we're now a nation, and we have irrigation, stone fortresses, food, and a lot of metals. Want to be friends? A lot of countries came and tried to take those metals, but Armenians kept fighting them off until Tigran the Great, he's Armenian. He builds a bunch of big fortresses around his Armenian kingdoms that stretch from sea to sea and names them after himself including Tigranakert in Artsakh. Then Christianity comes, and this guy called Mashtot pulls the Armenian alphabet out of thin air and needs to teach it to someone. So he opens up the first ever university in the world, 
in Amaras, located in Artsakh. Wow. Until the Tatar and Mongol nomad tribes show up and try to kill everybody. And now they live there too and call it home. Sweet. Then Russia shows up and says, I want some too. But Russia is big. And the Ottomans are like, I can take some while no one's looking. In 1750, they established the first Turkish Hanate in the region. And for the first time, the name Karabakh is used for Artsakh. Then the Russians came back and everything got groovy with culture. But one day the Russian Empire goes to a big war and collapses. So in 1918, the Armenians of Artsakh are like, okay, are we finally free? Nope, said the Turks. But then the Russians come back and they're red now. And the Armenians of Artsakh are like, okay, are we free now? No, we decide who lives here now. And the Soviets gave Karabakh to the new state of Soviet Azerbaijan because we divide and rule. And of course, they live happily ever after. Nope. Azerbaijan bombs Armenian churches and monuments and massacres Armenians to make Shushi look like more of an Azerbaijani region. And people live a great life under the new Soviet Azerbaijan, waiting for freedom. And when they finally can't take it anymore, in 1988, they rightfully get free from Azerbaijan after many tries. But wait, no, Azerbaijan can't let the peaceful Armenians of Artsakh have this little piece of land. So to prove their point, they kill a ton of Armenians in Baku and Sumgait, which have nothing to do with Artsakh except for they were Armenians. To add to the madness, the USSR comes crashing down. Understanding they'll get threatened by Azerbaijanis again, people of Artsakh vote in a referendum in line with the USSR and international law and declare their independence in 1991. In exactly the same way, and a full 19 days before Azerbaijan gets its own independence. And now, the Armenians of Artsakh are finally free and independent. But Azerbaijan is mad about it, so it decides to invade the free country of Artsakh. So a bunch of villagers who are tired of not having a country start fighting. And wait, what? They win! Freedom! Finally? No. Over the next 30 years, Azerbaijan retreats and builds up its military to be way larger than the little Republic of Artsakh. While Artsakh builds ministries, schools, roads, and even free universities, like Mashtos did. Hello world, do you recognize me? I have democracy. Can you come visit? And there are concerts, museums, and tourism. Until 2020, when Azerbaijan attacks some more and brings Turkey and Syrian jihadists along too, and says Artsakh attacked them. Because we live in a world of absurdism. All right, I think I will stop here, um, Pastor Emily. I don't know how long we have, but uh, I, I guess it will, it's, it's time if you wish so for some questions. We have, thank you so much, Zavin. That's so, so very informative. You had mentioned that the very end, there would be one way, ways that you could share with us with communities such as ours. Very quickly, can, yes. Yeah. First of all, we need your prayers. We need your prayers. We need your fervent prayers for the Armenian nation and, and uh, for the future of the uh, people of Artsakh. Uh, secondly, we need you to raise awareness. As I mentioned, there is uh, a, a house resolution now that recognizes the independence of Artsakh. Uh, in, in all ways, uh, we need um, Americans to uh, know more about uh, the uh, issue, know more about the people, know more about the crisis, and uh, help us raise awareness so that uh, that can come true. And then finally, of course, uh, if uh, all those who would like to monetarily assist the AMA in its uh, um, services and programs, we welcome, of course, the AMA website is a good uh, uh, place to start. So uh, brief and short, those are the three things that you can do and, and we like to, to see that uh, engaging. That's very helpful. So we have about five minutes for questions if there are any from the floor. And I do see that uh, Charlie Nahabedian has his hand raised. Um, is it possible? Uh, to get access to the slides or the video that we can use to share with our friends that we want to discuss it with. Yep, I, have, uh, Christine will ahead, share Chris. that with, uh, with the church uh, and then the church can share, yes, definitely. And with the other clip yep. that we didn't show as well, some of the other clips, we certainly, and, and the PowerPoint present, everything can be shared, certainly. 
Thank you so much. And Christine has already shared it with me, so I'll send it out to um, the church, this slide and the recording of this class as well for those who missed it. Sometimes we post it on our website. Um, if that would be agreeable with you all, we could, we could also link it to the church website. Mm. It's okay with us. It's up uh, to the church. I, they want does uh, Azerbaijan want you? Uh, it seems like you'd be a thorn in their sides. And I, I wasn't the United Nations involved in drawing borders of Azerbaijan. Didn't that start this problem to some degree after the collapse of the Soviet Union or am I forgetting? Yes, yes. unfortunately, unfortunately, the big powers who have a lot of interest in oil in Azerbaijan uh, have recognized the, uh, the country's borders as is including the enclave of Artsakh. Uh, and that's why uh, Azerbaijan, excuse me, the United Nations has not been helpful uh, to the people of Artsakh. Uh, and, uh, and the people of Artsakh to this date absolutely uh, refuse to live in that area under Azeri rule. There will not be any Armenian in that area if, uh, if um, Artsakh's self-determination is not recognized. Do they think there's oil in your area, but why do they want you? Why is Azerbaijan so set on including you? Uh, it's a good like question. The, good question that can be yeah, asked to Turkey it, as it, well. When they massacred our, our fathers and grandfathers, uh, a million and a half uh, Armenians in 1915 and uh, threw uh, the, the survivors out of the area, you know, what did they want? Uh, I think, you know, they want everything that they can get, that they can put their hands on, uh, obviously. Emily, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and ask the question then. Emily seems to be on mute. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for a very thoughtful and a very thoughtful provoking uh, presentation. It was wonderful to hear what you had to say. I noticed towards the end of your presentation, you used the word martyr, and that's usually used when one has a religious conflict. And in doing a little bit of research for this meeting this morning, I found that the London School of Economics had been discussed, has been discussing religious discord on conflict in your area and treating it as a religious war and not a civil war. There's a second background piece. There's a political science professor at Harvard by the name of Sam Huntington. And he wrote a book called Clash of Civilizations. And he says that whenever you have a Muslim majority and a Christian minority, that exactly what has happened to Armenia will happen to everyone. I wonder what you are doing in addition to the good works to change the understanding of exactly what kind of a conflict this is? Well, <clears throat> religion is part of it. It's, it's not all of it and it's not and discounted, definitely. Religion is definitely part of it. Uh, polit politicians use religion to, uh, um, uh, towards their goals and their aims. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens uh, that's what happened in 1915, and certainly it happens now as well. There was mm, a mosque in Shushi. After the Armenians won the war in 1994, Armenians renovated that mosque. And it stands now a beautiful mosque in the center of Shushi, next to the Armenian church, ready for the Muslims to exercise their religion. But what the others have done, what the Turks have done <clears throat> to Armenian religious uh, structures, churches, uh, and incited religious uh, animosity, hatred uh, is uh, unavoidable or undeniable, unfortunately. Uh, so that's how we like to um, uh, see the example of Shushi is, is one uh, that uh, as neighbors, you know, not under the dominance, but as neighbors with, with Turkey and Azerbaijan, Armenians have to live with, have to accept, 
to live with in the future. If we, if we want to stay where we have been for the past three, four thousand years, we certainly have to learn to live. We live very well with the Persian Muslims, Iranian Muslims. Relations are very good with Iranian Muslims. But the Turks, there comes, you see, the, the Turanic uh, and Ottoman uh, um, uh, dreams uh, and other political aims uh, that uh, uses religion as well uh, to make those objectives come true. So it's, Are the Turkish uh, Muslims primarily Shiite, uh, I believe? No, the Turks are, are, uh, are um, Sunnis. They are, the, so that's yes, a majority. The are, that. But the Azeris are Shiites. The Azeri Turks are Shiites. Well, that's the what Turks. I had heard, because I'm wondering what uh, approaches you've made to the United States government. You talked about uh, norms of international law. Certainly self-determination is one, but uh, it's interesting to me, if you read uh, again in the literature, you see that within the last number of years, say five or six years, the United States has given aid to both sides. I find that hard to believe. Once you look, I, if you look on Wikipedia, and you see the uh, genocide pictures, the photographs are so horrible that how can you possibly have a United States foreign policy that uh, gives money and guns and bombs, uh, so to speak, to both sides? Uh, is there no way to get more of an understanding of the righteousness of the Christian cause of the Armenians? We're trying our uh, advocacy groups in Washington, the Armenian Assembly, of America and the Armenian National uh, Council of America are trying hard uh, to bring this uh, awareness up there. Uh, and unfortunately, that parity that you're uh, referring to was even worse uh, during the Trump administration. The last four years, uh, Arme aid to Armenia and Artsakh was uh, even um, diminished to very, very uh, big disparity with, with what the Azeris are getting. Uh, again, uh, other interests come there, political interests, uh, economic interests. Uh, well, it's as Diane said a little while ago, it's the oil as well, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cut us off here, but this has been a very informative and very helpful and um, gut-wrenching and hope-filled presentation. So thank you so much, um, Zavan and Christine and Magda and for the work that you're doing and for um, the time um, everyone put in today. As I said, this, this has been recorded. We'll post it to the church website. If people want to, the slides have been shared. If people want to continue the conversation, we can do so. We can find ways to do so with friends and neighbors. Well, how about and, during the fellowship hour um, today? <laughs> That's a possibility as well. We can forward, I can forward the um, link to the Zoom fellowship if people want to continue that. That ended up happening last Sunday. We continued the adult education discussion during Zoom fellowship for those who want to, are able to do that. We can, we can do that as well. So many, many thanks and um, go into the day in peace. Blessings, everybody. Take care. Thank Have you. a blessed Sunday. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Okay. Salve. Thank you.